Hey, I'm going to let you in on a little secret before we start. Um, in March, when everything started to change pretty dramatically and quickly, I had this overwhelming fear for a couple of days that I was going to lose you. Like I just, it was like, kept me up at night. I, I felt like the church that we had poured blood, sweat, and tears into for four years and, and the ways in which you all have sacrificed to make this what it is, I was genuinely concerned that it was all just going to go away, that like all the work we had put in would be for naught. Um, and that was when I was in a headspace where I was believing for whatever reason that our church was dependent upon me. Um, which is never a place for a church leader to really be. It's not a healthy place, at least, for a church leader to be. It became quickly apparent as we continued to worship together via video and on Zoom, and we shifted everything to digital uh, platforms, and I got to spend time with you in your neighborhood, walking around, uh, seeing where you live and where you work, uh, and seeing the top half of your face, and getting to interact with you in a variety of different ways. It became really apparent to me that pandemic really has nothing to do with whether or not this church is going to be okay. And the reason for that is because this church wasn't my idea and it really wasn't any of your ideas. This church from the very beginning was God's idea. And I believe that genuinely. I didn't really want to plant a church. I didn't, for most of my life, didn't really even want to be a pastor. Um, So this wasn't really something that I just cooked up one day. And I wanted you to know that so you can rest assured that this is, you're not just part of some like fingers crossed experiment that Nathan decided to uh, start one day. Really, we're a part of something that I think outlists, outlives and outlasts all of us. I think it's something that's making a lasting impact on this city. And I'm really thankful that you continue to be a part of it. So thank you for sticking it out. And thank you for continuing to be a part of this church. I'm really, really grateful for all the things that we're going to continue to get to do as a family uh, because of the way that you stuck with it. So thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes, just, uh, I know it's hot, take a few minutes now just to share a little bit in line with our Fruit of the Spirit series. Everything has changed over the past uh, few months. Your lives have changed, your jobs have changed, your relationships and families have changed. One thing we wanted to stay the same, to, to you could kind of like anchor yourself to, is our teaching series. And so we've stuck with this Fruit of the Spirit series, and I, I honestly think that in some ways it's been more appropriate than anything we could have chosen specific to this time, because practicing the Fruit of the Spirit right now is maybe more important than any other time in my life, at least and maybe yours as well. Tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about um, gener- or, sorry, gentleness. Um, we're a little bit out of order. Next week, we'll talk about faithfulness. And in the following week, we're going to talk about uh, self-control. Now, I, I've not been described as a gentle person probably at any point in my life, okay? And maybe you have a similar experience. Know that you're, at least in my company, I don't know if that's good company, but if you haven't been described that way, you're not alone. Um, I can be direct, I can be uh, aggressive, I can be sort of acute in the things that I say. Uh, not cute, acute, for those in the back, just so we're clear. I, I can, can get myself into trouble sometimes in the way that I am uh, direct with people or aggressive towards things. Um, this comes out in the way that I interact with my kids, okay? So they, they'll tell you all the time that I interact with them sort of uh, aggressively in the way that we play a lot of times, right? So a couple weeks ago, they went to a birthday party and the party favor for each kid was like a kid sized yoga ball. Okay? Okay. My kids love these things. So they're in our kitchen and they're like bouncing on their butts on these, on these balls, all three of them, all about the same age or similar age, similar size, bouncing up and down. And I'm in the kitchen. And my first thought is I bet if I time it right, I can kick the ball out from underneath them and then they'll fall straight to the ground. Right? So my, then the goal is like, can I, can I keep all three of them off the ball at the same time? Can I move fast enough to do that? And this game is going really well for me. I'm really successful in this goal that I've set for myself and I'm kicking the ball and they're laughing and giggling and bouncing up and down. And Lucas, without um, telling me, uh, which is normal, uh, but without telling me, flips over onto his stomach and decides to bounce on his stomach. But I'm not paying attention because again, this game is going really well for me. And so I kick a ball out from under him and he lands straight on his face bloodies his lip. He's bruised. I pick him up. I console him. I apologize. Um, and then we get like right back to the game, just kind of exactly as we did before. Um, my kids are used to that. They're accustomed to that kind of like, that's one of the ways that dad plays and that's how we have a good time together. Um, but I don't really have a reputation for being a very gentle person. Um, what's, what's more is that gentleness is not something that, um, we think very abstractly about in our family. A lot of times, and maybe this is the case for you too, we think of gentleness as sort of a physical thing, right? It's, it's about how my body interacts with your body or another person's body. It's really more physical. But when we think about the fruit of the spirit, we're not talking about something that's physical. It might have physical manifestations, but it begins with something spiritual. So gentleness has to be something that we see kind of expanding beyond that. 
Uh, gentleness isn't something that my kids are, um, are unfamiliar with. We, we pray a prayer over them every night, and we pray that God would, would help them to become uh, strong, courageous, gentle, and generous. Those are four family values that the HOAGs hold to, strong, courageous, gentle, and generous. So they're familiar with the term. Uh, but we're learning how to think of it more abstractly, not just in the way that our bodies interact, but also beyond that in a more spiritual sense. And that's what I want to talk a little bit about um, this evening. Um, we're going to be at, just kind of talk for a minute about this list that Paul lays out in Galatians chapter 5. I don't know about you, but a list like the one that Paul lays out for the fruit of the Spirit is not that helpful. Because Paul doesn't expound on any one of them. He doesn't explain what he means. He doesn't tell you um, the differences between one to the other. And it makes it difficult to really know what he means. And beyond that, I think it makes it difficult to differentiate one from the other. As an example, if I'm honest with you, I find it really difficult to differentiate between kindness and gentleness. They end up looking or feeling a lot like the same thing to me. And it's possible that Paul was repeating himself with synonyms in order to make a point. It's certainly possible. And my guess is he had absolutely no idea that a guy like me would be overanalyzing his list 2,000 years later. So he may have written it a little bit differently had he known people like us were going to come along and think through these things. But it's important, I think, for me at least, to go about looking at what these things are and looking at different resources to understand what the list really is and to understand what the list really means. I think that it may may feel a little bit like splitting hairs, but there is a slight difference between kindness and gentleness. And the best way for me to understand it and the best way for me to describe it is to think about kindness as the way, is the act itself. Like, you can think of something you've done or maybe left undone that could either be described as kind or unkind. You could probably think of something right now. Like, you've done something recently that was either kind or unkind. But gentleness is something that we use to describe our method, right? It's how we go about the work. So you can do something kind, uh, kindly, but not do it gently, necessarily. I'll give you an example. On on 4th of July, um, our family made a few pies and passed them around to neighbors, okay? So we hopped, as we do, we hopped on our bike and we did like little pie deliveries around the neighborhood, which was a lot of fun. Making a pie for your neighbor is a kind thing. I think that's a kind thing to do, pretty much across the board. I don't know that anybody could argue with that, right? But in the way that I deliver the pie, that's a pretty... Uh, it's an opportunity for either gentleness or aggression, right? If I throw the pie at their house or their front door, that's an aggressive way to deliver a pie. I think it was still kind that I made them a pie, but I didn't, do, I didn't deliver it in a gentle way. But instead, we went house to house, door to door, knocked on the door, handed them the pie, thanked them for being great neighbors, told them that we're there for them if they need us, that kind of thing. So we practice both kindness and gentleness at the same time. And I think that both are required, and it's the cross-section of the two where we find neighborliness. I think you and I become good neighbors, um, healthy neighbors, loving neighbors, when we find a way to be both gentle and kind at the same time. Um, There's a list that, uh, or sorry, there's a letter that Paul wrote uh, later on that I think actually gives um, even more texture to what it means to be gentle and to be kind and what this actually looks like. Towards the end of the New Testament, and it's pretty easy to find because it's labeled by this guy's name, Paul wrote a couple of letters to a guy named Timothy, okay? And you can find these are pretty easy. From all accounts that we can tell, Timothy was younger, less experienced. Paul was kind of mentoring him along and teaching him a little bit about uh, this is what it looks like to be a pastor or a minister in some way in the first century. And at some point in the second letter, Paul writes this to Timothy. He says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. It's interesting because not only does he hit on several fruit of the Spirit just in that verse and a half, but he doesn't say that we have to stop teaching or stop disagreeing or stop um, correcting. Rather, he says the way in which we go about that should be one of gentleness. And it's been an important lesson for me to learn what it looks like to teach, to correct, to institute, and to fight for change, but to do so in a gentle way, because I think what Paul is really getting at here is a longevity in gentleness. One way for you to think about gentleness or the opposite aggression would be that gentleness is slow and aggression is hasty. Gentleness is slow and aggression is hasty. Now, sometimes circumstances call for a more aggressive approach, right? A house across the street is on fire. You approach that aggressively. You don't spend time thinking about the gentlest way to to remedy that situation. 
uh, th this happened when Lucas was like maybe about a year, year and a half. We were at a park, and, and it was like one of those parks where everything was wood chips, right, underneath the playground area. And I was with all the kids, but I was the only parent in the situation. And I, like, look over at my daughters for a minute, and I look back at Lucas, and he's, he's like, far enough away that I can't really get to him in time. And he's got this large wood chip in his hand, and in, like, slow motion, not ever breaking eye contact with me, he's just putting it closer and closer to his mouth, puts it into his mouth, and then tries to swallow it, and it gets stuck in his windpipe. And so I run over to him, and I throw him over my knee, and at any distance, it would look like I'm just beating this kid on his back, right? I'm just hitting him, just trying to get this dislodged, right? I'm, I'm doing all the right stuff, but it's an aggressive way to go about this. I'm, I'm aggressively trying to dislodge something from my son's windpipe. Now, we dislodged it, and he's fine. Um, and after the fact, we had some more gentle conversations around uh, don't eat wood. Like, that's just a rule in our house. Do not eat wood anymore. And that was a, that was a more gentle, long-term way to hopefully help that, prevent that from happening again. And so there's a moment sometimes when there's a crisis where we, uh, we respond aggressively. But then there has to be a time, too, where we shift and where we change our thinking and we move towards gentleness because we want to see long-term and lasting change. I've had to learn this lesson uh, in some ways the hard way, but I also think in some ways the right way over the past couple of months, particularly the last month. I've had lots of conversations, and you probably have too, over the last month about race and racism, and this is one of the reasons why that group is beginning. Um, and in my conversations and in some of the things that I've said, I've offended people, I've bothered people, I've upset people, and, you, and some of you may be those people, and some of you may have felt bothered by some of those things. And some of you may have said some things that bothered other people uh, because you were maybe aggressive in, your, in the way you were saying things. And I think there was a time there where that was appropriate because in some ways the house was on fire, right? And in some ways we needed to do something and to say something even if we didn't know exactly the right thing because something needed to be done. Somebody was choking on a piece of wood and someone needed to give them the Heimlich. But now, I think, for me at least, and I'm going to just kind of make this commitment to you, I'm turning a corner towards the gentleness that Paul recommends for Timothy. Because I want to be able to teach and correct in such a way that leads to lasting and meaningful change. And I think that the best way to do that is to do that with gentleness. And so I could continue to make to do kind things for people, but if I can't learn gentleness, then the kindness may be lost because the method sometimes is just as, if not more important, than the activity itself. How we go about our teaching and correcting is vital to the long-term success of those things. Gentleness, as hard as it is to muster in the face of adversity and aggression, must be a characteristic that we employ as followers of the way of Jesus. It is gifted to us and granted to us by the Spirit and something that the Spirit is cultivating in us. It doesn't always feel comfortable because sometimes it feels like there's another way, but gentleness is the thing that I want us to commit to so we can see lasting change in our city and beyond. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for an opportunity to gather together and to consider what your word has to say about this particular way of living and interacting. We pray, God, that you would stir up in us gentleness. Um, that we would be effective and, and responsive in the things that we need to be, but we would also turn towards gentleness for long-term change so that we could correct, correct and teach in a way that um, puts down significant roots and steers the ship in a different direction. I thank you, God, so much for the people who are here tonight. Thank you for the people who are live streaming this. Um, even though they can't be here physically, we pray, God, that you would develop in us a sense of connection, even though we are in many ways separate from each other. Uh, we love you, Lord, and we pray these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.